Greetings, everyone. This is DJ Wells from the Mensa Research Institute, and thank you for joining us again for our uh, what's going to be a weekly series for the next few weeks on boosting our immune health in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as we did last week, uh, we have uh, Dr. Albert Mensa and Samantha Jobert with us who will be sharing their insight on things that we can do to boost our immune, our immune health. Uh, and also we'll be answering questions that you're sending in uh, as part of this webinar. Uh, I remind you that the chat function, the, I'm sorry, the Q&A function uh, on your webinar portal there uh, is how you submit questions to us. Uh, while Dr. Mensa and, and Ms. Gilbert are uh, doing their first 15, 20 minutes or so uh, covering some, some important topics, go ahead and send your questions in. Uh, in about 20, 25 minutes uh, after the two of them have had their initial say, uh, I'll come back, I'll try and consolidate and, and, and collect the questions that you're submitting and feed them to uh, Dr. Mensa and Ms. Gilbert so that they can answer those questions for you. Uh, I should point out that last week, things were going so well and we had so many great questions that we ran over by about 15, 20 minutes. And both Ms. Gilbert and Dr. Mensa have said that we can go as much as 30 minutes over today. So if you've got questions, go ahead and send them in. You know, we're scheduled to go until five, but um, if we go until 5.30, then that's, that's not a big deal. That's something that we're actually planning for. So uh, please do send in your questions as they arise. Uh, and we also got a, a few folks who emailed in questions in advance of this webinar. So we've got a few questions to get us started uh, right away. So, uh, but before we do that, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Mensa and to Ms. Gilbert uh, so that they can share some, uh, some preliminary thoughts with you. And then I'll come back in about, uh, like I said, about 15, 20 minutes and we'll start the Q&A session. So Sam and Dr. Mensa, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, DJ. Thank you, Ms. Thank you Sammy, for coming on board and uh, Thank you. sharing this time with you. Um, there are a couple of things I want to say. First of all, um, you know, we, we talked about all this going on really for immune support purposes and the, the whole idea of helping us do better during this time while we're waiting for whatever treatment that is appropriate or um, protective agents to be around for us in the more general population. You know, one of the things we talk about, the reason we're doing this, right, Sammy, is that we want people to have some level of power and to realize they're not powerless in this process. We hear about what to do in terms of, oh, well, washing your hands and all these things. That's all stuff that's important. But what are you doing to bolster yourself personally? You know, those are kind of like defensive elements. And when I say defensive, okay, most of you know out there I'm a science fiction fan, right? So um, it's like having a, a, a force field around you, and that's the defensive element. But what happens if you don't have a force field? You don't go into war or battle without armor, okay? So most of us have depleted armor by way of what we do or by way of what we don't do. And this is what Sammy and I are talking about in this series how to create that armor, fortify the armor that we all have, so that when those stray viruses and those bullets come towards us, they pretty much just bounce off, or leave just perhaps a little dent, but they don't really harm us tremendously. And that's the goal of, of this set of discussions that we're having for the next several weeks, okay? Excellent. Sammy. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mensa. I, um... You know, along the same lines, I know, Dr. Mensa, you're going to talk about some supplemental therapies and give some people some guidance in that sense. Um, I'm really excited to talk about ways you can fortify um, your tower, if you will, with, with food um, and specific types of foods. I want to talk 
uh, about probiotics, something called prebiotics. Some of you may not know what that means. And then there are some subcategories, especially a prebiotic, specifically something called resistant starch. And I'll get into that in a moment. But one thing I want to say is that you can't out supplement a bad diet. And what I mean by that is not that nutrients are bad, because that's what we're talking about here. Uh, if you are a patient and you're watching and you're tuning in, you know the power of nutrients. Uh, you have your compounded formula as I do and I've been taking for many years now and it has fortified my body. But I'm also really diligent and, and wanting to be you know, completely honest and transparent that what you eat and how you choose to fortify your body with the foods that you eat plays a huge role in allowing nutrients to um, fortify you to, to, to the best of ability that they can and make your body strong um, and, and of course ward off these invaders and this pandemic that we're, that we're in right now. So with that being said, I love this analogy that Dr. Mensa and I have and it is um, the analogy of the engine in your car. You know, we think of the engine as kind of the heart of our automobiles. Um, it converts fuel into energy to power it. And I want you to think your, about your body in the same way, that what you're eating and how you're fueling your body is how, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be powered and how it's going to ward off invaders. So let's talk about a little bit about the digestive process. And then of course, I want to turn it over to Dr. Mensa. So there are chemical and of course, mechanical ways of fortifying your body and that whole process, just like with your car, you've got your oil, you've got your gasoline. And then there's of course, a whole electrical system that needs to be uh, maintained for it to function properly. We have chemicals in our bodies uh, called enzymes that help us digest our food, that help take in what we eat and convert it into energy. And that process actually starts in our mouths. It's really extraordinary. And as that process starts with the saliva that we have and the enzymes that we have in our saliva, um, we have what we, that would be a chemical process. Then we have a mechanical process process and that would be something like as simple as chewing your food and slowing down and I will be the first person to say that um, I've traditionally been kind of a fast eater kind of a nervous eater and when I learned how to really take my time and slow down that allowed my body to really take in the nutrients from my food absorb them properly and it also really aids in digestion Something as simple as a little chewing exercise can actually eliminate gas and bloating. And I know that may seem outrageous because we like to go to things that are um, what I call tier three, which is a supplemental therapy. Um, but there's a lot that you can do mechanically, just like with your car, uh, to aid in that process. So let's just talk about some probiotics and some prebiotics. I have a nice little list here. Some of these things I talked about last time, uh, most of you know what probiotics are. Um, probiotics are those guys that, again, help um, uh, uh, fortify us and, and give us our immune systems that reside in our GI tract. So some foods that are wonderful um, probiotic foods are uh, kimchi and sauerkraut, um, uh, fermented vegetables, and then, of course, coconut yogurt and coconut kefir. Those are things that I often recommend because I'm staying away from the dairy. Um, and then I want to talk about prebiotics. Um, prebiotics, they're really amazing because they, they feed the, you know, the good guys. They feed those probiotics. They, they provide fuel for them so that you can then, in turn, have that fuel uh, you know, to function optimally. So things like onions. Um, Jerusalem artichoke, I mentioned flax last time. Flax meal is a potent prebiotic. Um, asparagus, leeks, um, uh, even bananas. Uh, I have a lot of great recipes that I don't want to forget to tell you about on my website. If you go to eat4.life and you click on journal, um, you'll see uh, you know, lots of articles, but also if you scroll down, you'll see lots of recipes. I've got a banana ice cream recipe there. Now I know we talked about cold and hot foods last time, um, but if you're stress eating right now, because there's, there's a lot going on, which I understand, 
Um, I want you to go to something healthy. So check out my banana ice cream recipe, which is super easy to make. And um, it's also, you know, we're talking about fortifying here regardless of the temperature. But I want you to have good options when, you know, you want a treat and you want something because it's just, there's a lot going on right now and there's no really easy solution. Um, garlic is a wonderful way to fortify your immune system. We talked about turmeric and ginger, cooking with all of those in addition to garlic. Another great way, a, a prebiotic and another great way to help ward off those invaders. Um, I, I talked about polyphenols last time, blueberries, uh, again, the flax. Um, uh, uh, green tea is a potent and uh, antimicrobial and anti um, uh, uh, biofilm activity modulator. So that's one of the reasons I really like green tea. Um, and I feel that in addition to being in that polyphenol category and into that, that kind of um, uh, supportive role, it has some interesting components to it that also are going to help your immune system. Um, and just briefly, I want to talk about resistant starch because Resistant starch is something that I know has been out there, but it's something that is um, a, a, another powerful agent in, in supporting your gut and uh, creating food for those microbes to give you that, that immune system. Um, resistant starch is um, it, it's called resistant starch because it resists digestion. And so basically when things are, oh, I think I have, I think I lost connection. Can, can you can you hear me okay, uh, Dr. Mensa? There you go. We can hear you. Okay. Okay, great. I'm sorry. I thought I lost my connection there. Um, so it resists digestion in the small intestine, intestine and then ferments in the large intestine. Um, and these fibers, again, they act as, as food for the good guys. They act as a prebiotic, as I mentioned, um, to support your immune system. So cooked and cooled potatoes. I know potatoes get a bad rap, but it, from a molecular standpoint, when you cook and cool them, they turn into resistant starch. You're actually changing them into a whole different food. Um, green bananas, green plantains. I love using uh, plantain flour and banana flour in a lot of my recipes. Um, and some lagoons, uh, specifically things like um, uh, lentils and white beans, those can also be uh, in that kind of resistant starch category. So I want you, I want to encourage you uh, to think about these things next time you're at the store. I was at Whole Foods uh, yesterday morning, and again, the produce aisle, the produce section, uh, everything was, was fully stocked. Whereas again, the canned goods, um, and then I, you know, some of the frozen items, those things are, are absent, but I, I still want to encourage you to go to the fresh produce. And all of these things I'm talking about are readily available also online if you're not able to get out. Um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll hand things over to Dr. Mensa. I tried to be real quick here because I want to leave time for all of your questions and, and your concerns. I know we weren't able to get to everyone last time, but, but Dr. Mensa, what would you like to add to that? First of all, thank you for that really excellent discussion. You know, one of the things I want to talk about, we always talk about the brain being a factory and it produces all these wonderful chemicals and neurotransmitters. Your gut is also a factory. Um, various organs are, in fact, most of you is really just one giant factory. So now, in order to make a product, you've got to have the right raw materials. And Sammy has given you some wonderful thoughts and discussions about certain materials that can be used to do a variety of things. Now let's tie this back into our immune health. So quite often I see people taking products for their GI tract and for their liver and they're saying, well, we need to cleanse our liver. We need to cleanse our liver. And then the diet is nowhere near beneficial for cleansing that liver. The liver is not only responsible for dealing with detoxification. The liver is also responsible for helping with immune health. Now, many of you may not know that, but the liver is definitely a major player in your immune health. Now, let's get some structure involved here. We call um, every cell in the human body basically your own private little miniature factory. And the outside of that cell, the round part that keeps 
the outside world out and the inside world in is made up of what we call a cell membrane. It is a, a structure that allows that protection. That cell membrane is made of fats, okay? So why don't you remember that? Now let's talk about this in terms of the liver. The liver is a powerful organ and it's a large organ, believe it or not. I want you to understand this, that cell membrane we're talking about, the liver has over 35,000 square feet of cellular membrane surface. What does that really mean? Have you ever been to a football game and been to a football field? And I mean like the full size football field, not the ones for kids. Okay, take seven of those, that's 35,000 square feet of surface area. Okay, that's what your liver has to work with. Now, what happens every X number of days, every few months or so, every cell and every cell membrane in that liver changes over. The dead stuff goes away and a new one forms, okay? It doesn't just happen by magic. Your body uses whatever it's got in terms of raw materials to make those cellular membranes. Now, here's the deal. Those cell membranes are made of fats, the right type of fats. But if all your liver is exposed to are the, forgive me, the crappy fats from bad diet, mm -hmm. from all sorts of horrible products, including stuff from bottled water, we're gonna get into that, canola oil, partially hydrogenated oils, okay? This is all the liver knows, and it says, hey, this is all I've got to work with, so I'm gonna build my cell membranes with all the bad fats and all the plastics. Let's just call them plastics for that matter, okay? So now you've got your liver structure in part or in whole, being recreated in the image of plastics as opposed to the image of appropriate fatty tissue. That fat is key because it allows nutrients to move in and outside of the cell properly because there's a, a gateway here in, in all different parts of the cell. So if you're eating poorly and you're at the same time taking all these liver cleansing products, well, guess what? It doesn't undo what you think it does because the structure of the liver is no longer the way it was originally designed. And what happens at that point in time? The liver can get inflamed, your immune health goes down the tubes, and then many of you sit down and you say, well, now my cholesterol is high, but I'm doing pretty well, I don't understand this. You know, I don't have heart disease, I don't have anything, my cholesterol is high. Folks, let's turn this on its head here. We assume that high cholesterol has to do with the propensity for getting a heart attack. That's what we're, as doctors, are told, and that's what we tell our patients. Let's turn it on its ear. What if having a high cholesterol was really the liver telling you something? And it's not telling you that you've got heart disease. It's actually telling you that something is wrong in the system and it's trying to clear it up. High levels of cholesterol, let's think a little bit differently here. High levels of cholesterol may actually be the liver trying to wash or clean itself. Number one. Number two, if you've got imbalance in hormones, and many females think about this, and males are now thinking about this. The liver is sitting back saying, well, you know what? I'm partially responsible for hormone production by developing or producing the baseline element or structure by which all hormones are made, and that is cholesterol. So your cholesterol could also reflect imbalanced levels of hormones that you may not even be aware of. So don't assume that because your cholesterol is high, it's because you're sick in other areas, it may be the liver trying to tell you something. It may be the liver trying to heal itself. And at the same time, if you're allowing your kids and you know, parents out there who've got children with autism and also a lot of other behavior disorder things, you're worried about the liver, you're worried about the GI tract, but you're letting your kids eat those McNuggets because you're saying that's all they're gonna eat. And we've talked about this already in previous sessions where it's like, give your kids only the, the foods that you want them to eat and eventually they will come around because they don't want to stop, okay? But all these fats are being incorporated into the design of the liver, and how can you possibly think it's gonna function properly? It can't, because it can only make products as a factory with the raw materials it's given, okay? And when that happens, of course, now we find out, well, zinc gets depleted, a variety of proper nutrients get depleted, from the gallbladder, bile is not gonna be able to function as well as it should be. So there are a tremendous number of challenges when we're not eating properly and we're doing things that we think are beneficial for us, but then we turn around and we don't give the proper 
basic nutrients necessary. I want you to remember seven football fields of membrane working on your behalf to help detoxify your system and support your immune health. And if what you're indulging your system in is, is a bunch of really toxic foodstuffs and inflammatory foodstuffs, listen, the whole system works together, the liver, the gallbladder, the kidneys, the uh, GI tract, you've got 500 species of critters, if you want to call them, uh, microbes in the GI tract that all need to be fed properly with good prebiotics. Any liches in any of those systems produces inflammation and weakens your immunity. Weakens it. So I wanted to go molecular with you there for a moment to talk about what is really happening with the liver and some of these things that we thought were toxic pathologies. Now, what does that mean? There's some controversial things we have to think about. And I almost dare not say this, but listen, within certain categories, it may not be to your benefit to actually take some of those pharmaceutical medications that lower your cholesterol. If you're not in a high risk group, you've got to reconsider because those medications are indeed toxic. Those medications are indeed inflammatory. Now, please, I have prescribed them. And I'm sitting here telling you when we're looking at things a little bit differently now, and I mean for, for younger folks, I'm not talking to folks who are you know, much senior and, and a variety of things like that. Talk to your doctor, look at your risk profile. But things like those medications, anti-inflammatory agents, a variety of things can be damaging or inflammatory to the liver. And we have to be more aware and ask ourselves this question. I know back in med school, they told us about high cholesterol, triglycerides, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're bad, da 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 But you know what? Most of strokes and cardiac heart attacks, those kinds of things, happen with people who have normal lipid profiles. Normal. So what's going on here? We have to consider another option. And maybe when we see high cholesterol, we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to our livers? What are we doing to our entire GI tract? That's causing the cholesterol, the liver, to say, hey, this is a warning to you. I'm putting out there the high cholesterol because I'm trying to clean myself, and I'm also trying to help shift the capacities of imbalanced hormones, okay? A couple of things we want to talk about there. Now, you know, my, my best friend in, in medicine here uh, in, in our molecular world is one of my best friends anyway, is zinc, right? So, you know, zinc is important in immune health, but I'm going to cross over into Sammy's dimension here for a moment and tell you about some of your favorite things that most of you out there are going to reel with regard to me saying this, okay? Your coffee steals zinc from your system. I'm sorry. Your morning, your morning cup of joe, your afternoon, whatever. There are all sorts of articles talking about all the great benefits of coffee and this and this and this. But guess what? It steals your zinc, folks. Not just coffee, but many teas, not the green tea, but many teas do the same. And then lo and behold, our lovely folks who love their evening alcohol, who love their binge alcohol on the weekends, Oh, gosh, we're taking our nutrient programs, but can I have a little bit of alcohol as well? I said, well, you know what? Sure, you go ahead. But here's the thing. Understand, it steals your zinc, okay? So if your zinc levels are not where they should be when we've retested you, and you say, oh, but honestly, Dr. Mensa, uh, uh, Dr. Bowman, you know what? We've been taking our nutrients, but you're not telling us that you're partying on the weekends in a big sort of way, drinking all that alcohol, and it's decreasing your zinc level. That's a problem, okay? So... That's all I'm going to say right now until we get to our next topic. But please, when you're talking about the liver, when you're talking about your liver cleanses and all those things you do, you better check what else you're putting into your body. If you're giving it plastics, if you're giving your children plastics with the French fries, the fried foods, and forgive me, I forgot to mention, even the artificial sweeteners are not your friends. Mm -hmm. The aspartame, the um, stevia, the Splenda. I won't tell you the people I know who live by Splenda. It'd be a shame to say it. But let me tell you, that stuff is not good for you, ultimately. And I know what you're thinking. Well, what the heck, Dr. Mensa, Sammy, what can we eat? All the good stuff is gone. <laughs> Listen, it's about giving you education so that you have choice, so that you know what's going on. And that's where I'm going to stop. Sammy? Yeah, that, that was awesome, Dr. Mensa. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I... Uh... I, you know, one of the things I, I loved about what you said, and, and just to clarify everyone, Dr. Mensa is talking about 
artificial versions of like Splenda and Truvia that use maybe the minutest amount of stevia. Um, the stevia that we recommend, that I recommend, is in its natural form and it is safe to consume. So just want to make sure that you're aware of that difference. That's what he's talking about. Um, what, I, what, what I thought of when you were sharing that, Dr. Mensa, is also all the sugar and the, sh the impact that sugar has on the liver um, and, and, of course, the processed foods, but also on, on the stomach and the stomach's ability to secrete hydrochloric acid. Uh, yes. which is actually the first line of defense against bacteria and parasites. What do acids do? They kill things. What does bile do? All that whole process. Um, and again, going back to the car analogy, this is your engine, folks. This is the area, the seat of where kind of, I like to say the magic happens in a sense, not that your brain isn't important, not the brain is, is not connected to the gut, the gut brain axis, I mentioned that last time, but we have to be very mindful. And there's way to do, ways to do this where things are enjoyable and tasty. I'm not talking about eating cardboard here, but um, you know, just the impact that all of these processed foods, all of these sugars, these chemical foods have in this regard is, is, goes far beyond what I think most people realize. And Dr. Mansa just demonstrated and described that process in great detail. So I really hope that, um, that that's powerful for you. You know, I have family members that uh, take their kids to McDonald's and it breaks my heart, but I can't do anything about that because that's their decision. Um, but these are not foods that are going to fuel your child's brain and, and their body. So, um, so yeah, thank you again, Dr. Mensa. And you know, when, when Sammy's talking about McDonald's, look, we're, we're human here and our kids, they don't understand. We're not talking about, all right, you went once a month. You know, when we were growing up, and I'm not going to date myself, but, you know, back in those, day, back in those days, you know, McDonald's is a treat you know, for after Little League or whatever have you, once a week, you know, once a week. Other than that, food was pretty well, you know, not pretty well handled. But now it's becoming a mainstay. And, and folks, I know we're preaching to the choir for most of you out there, but some of you don't realize the depth to which this is really a problem. You, you can't fix children with autism and expect that by giving them a, a regular diet that they enjoy, everything from all the inflammatory grains, the pastas, to, oh, they only like the McNuggets and the French fries and everything that, that makes most of us just kind of real when we hear this, their systems can't heal if you're, giving, if you're constantly re-inflaming them, whether it's brain or gut, okay? In either direction, there's serious damage and you're wondering why they're always sick, okay? Why they're always catching illness. And that's what we're talking about. We cannot survive, we cannot protect ourselves. Those things degrade our armor. We want to build our armor. And that's when we, we need the right foods. We need the right proportions. We need to feed the GI tract and the microbes in there appropriately. We need to do all those things. Okay. So, Sammy, any other thoughts? Or yeah, other thank questions? you. Yeah, thank you. I no, I I I think that I, and and I know that we, we you know we want to start taking um, um, questions and and help you. But uh, I rattled off a long list there for you. But and, and you can always contact me. Uh, on my Facebook page, or you can send me a DM, but I wanted to give you a comprehensive list of things that are going to be good and for your gut and build your immune system. That was my goal, uh, you know, in providing that long list. Um, but again, if you need assistance with that, you know, don't hesitate to reach out, but, but um, I'm, I'm ready. Um, and uh, Dr. Mensa, did you want to talk about specific nutrients to support, support the immune system as well? Um, and maybe some dosing to help people, or how would you how would you like to address that? Yeah, um, I wanted to do that last thing. First of all, the the good news is that most of you who are out there on our nutrient protocols, you're doing pretty well. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. But for the adults during the course of the next three months, I think that if you don't have, and I mean people who are not quite our seniors per se, um, who don't have bleeding disorders, who don't have a history of stroke who don't have a history of diabetes, you know, or hypertension, those individuals should be on at least a total of 3,000 milligrams now of vitamin C. Now, there are a few of you that I've talked to, an X number of our patients, I've given you a different dose, even higher, but that's because I've evaluated you personally, OK? 
okay? But we're talking about the average American right now. I would easily say uh, within the age categories of probably 20 to about 60 should be on at least three to 6,000 milligrams of vitamin C easily. And the average I'll just say is 3,000. If you're on one of our nutrient programs, certainly add another thousand to what it is I've already given you, okay, or what Dr. Bowman has given you. That's number one, vitamin C. Zinc is the next fellow. I don't care. Anyone in the United States of America right now should be on at least 50 milligrams of zinc. If you're not, get on it. Tell your family and friends, get on it. That's not treatment dose. And that's because we don't know what your zinc levels are right now. But it's benign enough that for three months, you can get a wonderful boost of support without actually moving into toxicity realm, okay? Now, please hear me when I'm giving these dosages. Don't turn around and say, well, you know, he said 50 is pretty good. What if I just doubled that and went to 100? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about something safe and beneficial for when you've not been tested because most people really on this planet are zinc deficient. They're zinc deficient. And zinc is a hugely powerful immune stimulator. It stimulates macrophages into development. It stimulates, it's part of the immune system. It stimulates DNA repair. It stimulates the production of acid, what it is that Samantha was talking about in your GI tract. You can't make hydrochloric acid if you don't have zinc. So now let's say you have your little alcohol to drink, steals your zinc, can't make your alcohol, I mean your, your acid in your stomach, so now you can't digest food. And now if you can't digest food, you become inflamed because your system is trying to deal with it. It becomes a vicious tornado of a cycle. So zinc, it does your body good. You gotta have it. 50 milligrams for the average adult, okay? Vitamin D, now here's a, a wonderful spectrum. You guys are good out there. Most of you are on some level of vitamin D, whether we say so or not. Some of you are in huge ranges, but right now what we suggest is at least 5,000 to 10,000 international units of vitamin D per adult in those age categories we talked about per day for at least the next three months until we see what the next phase of this immune onslaught is doing, okay? So we're talking about vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D. I'm not gonna talk about vitamin A. It is like a very good potent antioxidant, but it can become a little bit challenging on the liver. So it's very dependent on you know, who the people are out there. Vitamin E is another potent you know, creature, but it can lead to major bleeding challenges in people who've got coronary heart disease and a variety of those things. So we're not talking about doing any of those things. For now, we're talking about our big three, vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin D, quite honestly, just to get you going, okay? And Dr. Mensa, uh, I, you know, and I know um, we need to answer, start answering questions, but you and I talked about this the other evening as we were preparing for today, and I just, I can't stress enough to please not overdo, because we have so many patients um, that, you know, that say, okay, the more antimicrobial herbs, the better. I'm going to clean out my liver. Well, I had a client uh, overdo it and, you know, she got very sick. Um, I have people overdo zinc, uh, 200, 250 milligrams, which mm. is way, way, way too high. You're getting more into a toxicity level, as Dr. Mensa shared. Um, even glutathione. I, I was working with a young woman that uh, was was getting injections and it was such a high dose that it sent her into deep detox and she literally I think it took her about six months to recover and that's not an exaggeration nutrients are powerful um, We're all aware or most of us uh, You know most of you that are watching are aware of uh, dr. William Walsh's book nutrient power you know apt title uh, nutrients are powerful herbs are very very powerful so please be careful um, and uh, you know the doses as dr. Mensa shared are um, are safe and we don't recommend unless we're working with you personally that you overdo so just just be mindful absolutely to get very specific you know too high levels of zinc can cause anemia it causes what we call a microcytic hypochromic anemia okay you don't want to try to create the good and create bad all at the same time. Stay within the parameters that we're discussing or work with a, a licensed professional on these kinds of things if you're gonna think about doing them differently. Just be very, very cautious, okay? The timing, 
the timing of this conversation is actually quite appropriate because we've got a couple of questions from folks that are specifically asking about zinc. Um, and uh, one of the questions um, addresses something that I think you were just talking about there, Dr. Mintz, and that is uh, uh, someone who's saying um, her entire family has low, has been, you know, has been tested and, and have low zinc. Um, if we know that we're already low zinc, should we titrate up a little bit more um, than the 50 milligrams that you're suggesting? No. <laughs> okay. I there, thought that would be your answer. No. You talk to, if you're testing with us, you talk to us. If you're, if you're working with someone else, deal with that person that you're working with and find out exactly what your target goal is supposed to be. Parents and kids do not take, for example, the same levels of zinc. You dare not. Okay, you can cause some tremendously horrible things to happen to your children, including everything from detox to having some real issues with digestive tract functionality and, and so forth, um, yeast and a variety of other things that can happen. You do not want to do this by yourself. You find that licensed qualified professional and have them guide you, okay? This is not a game, believe me. More people have done, there, I'm gonna say more, there have been quite a few people who have done harm to their systems because they guessed what their target dosage was or they just ramped up immediately. Okay, not good. Caution, please. Thank you, Dr. Mensa. And before I get to the next question, um, I want to remind our participants that that Q&A session is open and a few people have started to chime in. So we're getting a few of these questions here, but certainly as any of you have additional questions, uh, please do send them in just type them into the Q&A section on the, uh, on the webinar portal here, and I'll go ahead and feed those questions to Dr. Mensa and, and to Samantha Gilbert uh, as we get them in. Um, another question that's specifically related to the conversation we were just having, um, and that is someone who's asking, are there any books out there um, that folks can turn to to learn specifically about the gut biome health that you were talking about earlier, Samantha, and um, you know what what are some other resources that folks can make use of to make sure that they're uh, getting at the right combination of nutrients and 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 the like. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, well, in our world, of course, and we haven't gotten into this. What I shared is kind of. I wanted to share a general um, kind of overview of, you know, again, the pre and the probiotic world and how you can fortify your body that way. But even within that world and the world that Dr. Mensa and I work in, there's a lot of variation there because everyone is so unique, especially with the underlying chemistries that we work with. So um, I have my cookbooks that are very uh, specific to the biotypes, the chemistries that we work with, because we also want to be mindful of that as well. Last time we talked about a little bit about protein and how undermethylators like myself do better with more protein. Someone that is overmethylated, which is too many methyl groups, they need more of a, a vegetable, more of a higher folate diet. Um, folates aren't really our friends as undermethylators. Um, so, you know, I have my resources on my website, um, but I think, you know, if, if you're looking for, for general, you know, guidance on the gut, just an understanding how food impacts the gut, one of my favorite books is, is Grain Brain. Um, and, you know, he's, I, 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 I always go to that, that book because there's just such a, a wealth of information in there and understanding that connection. Um, but I hope that's helpful. I think that uh, anytime, anything you can do to, be, to, to excuse me, boost the microbiome um, with uh, some of the foods that I mentioned, you're, you're doing yourself a service. And if there are, those are triggers for you, that means there's an underlying infection that needs to be worked on. And I don't recommend trying to do that on your, on your own. So I hope that's helpful. But you can also reach out to me when we're complete with this and 
um, you know, I, I'm happy to assist further. You know, I, I want to jump in here. Sammy, can you talk about, we were, when we were talking the other day, one of the things we talked about was SIBO, okay? Mm -hmm. That is a, a big preacher. A lot of people are referencing it. A lot of people are affected by it. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't get it right, okay? Sammy, can we talk about immune health? How can you have immune health if you're constantly battling a small intestinal bowel uh, uh, issue? Can you, can you comment on that a little bit, please, here? Yeah, that's an excellent question. That's, that's the challenge, and that's always my prayer for the people that I work with that have a lot of GI issues, whether it's SIBO or yeast or H. pylori or what have you, is that these types of conditions create what we call leaky gut, which is where that barrier that's supposed to protect us um, is, is open and wide open. And so these pathogens end up getting into the bloodstream. Uh, they impact our brain. They create things like brain fog and OCD and, um, you know, other, uh, these, uh, these other conditions. And they create a lot of inflammation in the body, a lot of chronic pain. So it's, it's difficult unless that is treated with, you know, of course, diet. And we want to make sure we know the individual's chemistry um, uh, underlying chemistry, you know, we've talked a lot about copper overload or toxicity, zinc deficiency, methylation, pyrrole disorder. We want to make sure that we understand that underlying chemistry because that's going to aid in healing and sealing the gut because that's what nutrients do. You know, Dr. Menzo has talked a lot about zinc and zinc's role in creating stomach acid. Zinc is also required to create hormones, uh, insulin. Um, uh, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, uh, you know, our, our stress hormones, um, making sure that those things are moderated appropriately. Um, so, so yes, that is a huge uh, component of the immune system and why I think so many people are um, wide open to attack these days because the underlying chemistry is not being uh, addressed and looked at. And, and so the gut isn't being sealed, if you will. And so the infections, they, they persist. You know, I work with a lot of people that have, uh, you know, worked with many, many uh, practitioners. And the missing piece I always say is, well, now we know you're undermethylated. Now we know that you're copper toxic and your zinc is, is, is low. And that's really going to help us in healing your gut. So I hope that that answered that question. I hope that that makes sense. It does. It does. Thank you, Sammy. You know, one of the things that people forget, we, we, we so often compartmentalize our disorders, okay? Our SIBO is here. My anxiety is there. My depression is there. And now I'm, I'm getting these multiple infections all these times, these viruses, these colds, I get flus all the times. Well, we've got to remember that if our, our GI tract is not nice and solid, if it's leaky as opposed to tight, now all that inflammation has a domino effect. That inflammation creates an immune reaction directed at trying to fix the, the leaky part of the GI tract. So now let's just say you've got a limited army and you send all of your soldiers over to the GI tract to try to heal it. Well, what does that mean for your lungs? What does that mean for other parts of your system? It means they're sitting there unguarded, unprotected, or at least with a minimal protection squad available. So that's when disease, that's when viruses, that's when bacteria can come in, set up shop, and replicate horrifically and start to take over because our immune system is already busy trying to fight something else. Or we don't have the proper nutrient balance, so we can't build up and support enough of our immune cells to be multifaceted and multifocal and try to protect all of our entire system. So while we're talking about the GI health aspect, we wanna tie it to immunity, to let everyone know that, hey, listen, what's going on over here affects your overall capacity to support and protect yourself, okay? That's why we're paying so much attention to both the macro world and the micro world here, okay? Thank you, Sam. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, and Dr. Mensa, just, uh, uh, I'm sorry, DJ, I, I, uh, uh, I just wanted to add to that, that if you have a gut infection, and you may not even know, but if you suspect or if you've already been tested, if you're one of our patients, I just, I cannot stress this enough because I went on a run this morning and I noticed people aren't taking social distancing measures um, seriously, 
if you have a child or yourself, again, and you have a, some kind of gut infection, whether it's SIBO or otherwise, I want to encourage you to really, really take that seriously. Just go out when you need to come back home um, uh, because you are exposing yourself unnecessarily and you are in a high risk category if you have SIBO, if you have leaky gut, if you have uh, yeast overgrowth, um, if you have H. pylori, you're in a high risk category. And, and I know a lot of people aren't seeing it that way, um, but I, I just, I want to encourage you with that. So anyway, I apologize. Um, oh, no. Uh, Bless you, Sammy. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, our folks, the, much of what we hear uh, of right now is directed to the general population. It's not directed towards the people that Sammy and I work with. Listen, if your child has autism or behavior disorder or a mood issue or anxiety, depression, things, you are in a susceptible group. You need to take those precautions seriously, okay? Because whatever is happening to the body in one area, the brain, if there's anxiety, depression, all that other stuff, it too is inflamed. It too is problematic because there's a deficiency that's common to both your brain and your body present or an excess deficiencies like zinc deficiency again or a vitamin c deficiency or vitamin d vitamin d is a powerful hormone i mean i talk about zinc but vitamin d is tremendously powerful it hits every single you know there's not a single system in your body a single chemical reaction that doesn't require vitamin d brain or body Vitamin D is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. And if your levels are low, like many of yours are, it's no wonder that you are depressed on one end and sick on the other end. I would say, you know, just because it's a personal favorite, I like the letter Z and, you know, it looks good and all that stuff. So zinc is, is one of my really powerful things, but vitamin D is very, very powerful in and of itself. So the bottom line point is that think about the categories of patients that we tend to work with in our worlds you all are just as susceptible as the people who've got the, the chronic disease in the entire uh, other side of the spectrum. You know, our septuagenarians and folks who've got heart disease and blah, 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 okay? You've heard of them, but please consider yourselves as being susceptible as well. Absolutely. Uh, we've got several good questions starting to line up here. And so uh, just wanna let folks know that we will get to your questions. Uh, if it takes us a minute to get to one that you may have typed, typed in, you know, 20, 30 minutes ago, know that I, I, we do have them and, and we will get to them. Um, Sammy, one thing, though, before we do get to those questions, and that is you mentioned your website, um, eat4.life. And I just want to make sure because, you know, these days, you know, with, with the millennials and, and, and the, the, the newer generations, they use numbers for words and, and that type of thing. So want to make sure that it's, is it eat in the number four or is it eat F-O-R? Yes, thank you for, yeah, thank you for clarifying. It is F-O-R. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so getting back to the, the topic that we were just talking about in terms of folks who are at a, at a higher risk factor, uh, one of the questions that came in, um, speaks to folks who have several things going on. Um, and this particular uh, question mentions uh, adults uh, in their 30s uh, who have autism, uh, who suffer through pyroluria, uh, who know that they've got some chemical and hormonal imbalances. Um, the question is, how do you attack all of these issues simultaneously? How do you eat for um, and work on all of these problems? You know, how, how do you combine your treatments to, to address multiple issues like this? Well, the thing is, Mr. Wells, it's exactly as you just said. We combine all this stuff because that's what we do. That's our skill set. That's our knowledge pool. We do that. That's why you have to work with a skilled professional. That's why there are the SAMIs and, and the Mensa Medicals, because we want to make sure that understanding some baseline pieces of information, we can now put together a comprehensive discussion and evaluation and treatment protocol. That's part and parcel of what we do. Okay. 
but the key is work with a, with a, with a professional. That's how you deal with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Mensa. Um, I've got a question here. Someone who's actually going back to our broadcasts from last week uh, and specifically the discussion on temperature and how it impacts um, the, the COVID virus and, and similar types of viruses that perhaps don't do quite as well in the heat. Um, and this particular question speaks to whether or not it's beneficial to set their home thermostats higher. Um, will living in a, in a warmer uh, home increase your body temperature to the point that it's uh, beneficial in terms of combating the coronavirus or, or other types of infections and viruses? That's a great Listen, question. For the sake of um, many people who are living in their 50s uh, and who are married, I'm not going to say to turn up the temperature to 89 degrees in the house. I can tell you not a favorite thing. Okay, it's not going to happen. All right, um, your core temperature regulates itself. Okay, so if you're trying to turn up the temperature, it's actually going to do a little thing about decreasing so that it maintains its 98.6. It's not going to go to 122. Okay. But the, the idea here is we may want to revisit giving medications if we get a slight fever, because an internal fever is the body trying to bake out, trying to make uncomfortable that invader that's trying to sit there and grow. So that's one of those things we now have to be cautious about. And even in regular medicine, we're talking about when we give anti-inflammatories or when we give Tylenol or when we give anything anymore. There's a whole school of practitioners who just say, we're not going to do it. Of the countries, they don't do it because they understand what the body is trying to do. But in your own house, listen, uh, if you're a man, I'll be hard pressed to be in your shoes with your wife, uh, you turning up the temperature that high. Okay. But on the other side, many people like to sleep in very cool temperatures. You got the folks who love the 67 degrees, you know, the 68 degrees. This may not be the best time to do that. But at the same time, sleep is very important for your immune health. So we're gonna to have to play a little bit of a game here looking at all the factors. Get your rest, whatever it takes. Be comfortable, whatever it takes, because that also decreases your stress hormones. And stress hormones can be just as damaging as anything else. So look at the big picture in your household. You know, If your wife says, hey, turn it up to 95, bless you. If you're a 67 type person, go to the living room, go to the basement, and then freeze your butt off and go to sleep. As long as you both get your rest and your family gets its rest, that's the best thing. Sammy? Very, yes, absolutely. I, I, yeah, sleep is, is a huge lifestyle modification that I help people with because, uh, as you know, Dr. Mensa, with many of our patients who are pyroloric, they're night owls. That is a common symptom or rather side effect of pyroluria. Um, so that can be really difficult in the beginning, but as the chemistry changes, as the diet becomes better um, and, and more uh, nutrient dense um, and more healing, then being in bed by 10 o'clock, which is what I recommend, becomes easier and easier to do. There are also things you can do, and I'm sure many of you have heard of these, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt to you know, kind of rehash this a little bit, but um, you know, amber glasses at night or amber light bulbs at night rather than this blue light that we're inundated with with our screens, shutting yeah. our screens two hours before going to bed. I know nobody wants to hear that. Um, but if you, you know, actually read an actual book, um, which I know we don't do anymore, but I like to read real books before I go to bed. And that, that helps me, you know, go into, you know, my, my deep beauty sleep, so to speak. Um, so these are all things that you can do. If you have to be on a screen, get some cheap amber glasses. You can get them on Amazon for, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks. They're also called night driving glasses. Uh, and they really do work. They do really protect that blue light. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you said that, Dr. Mensa, because sleep is so huge to the immune system. And now, especially with, with all the stress that everyone is under, with the uncertainty of our future and everything that's going on around the globe. So I do want to encourage you with those, those lifestyle modifications. 
Thank you, Sammy. One other thing when we're talking about temperature again, we're hopeful that this is the type of coronavirus cousin that sits there and actually will tone down when the, when the outside temperature warms up. That's typically what happens with viruses, but we don't know. And every doctor I know is very cautious about talking about anticipating that this thing will pretty much just go down to oblivion, you know, in the summer months. But we're also cautious about talking about what happens in terms of fall. And when fall kicks in and the temperature starts to go down again, if we don't have proper immunity or proper protection, are we going to see another spike in this? So again, our goal, Sammy and I, is to do our best to help you get your armor intact for whatever happens. If this thing spurs up again in October or whatever, or there's a new strain that's out there, you know, you know, whatever, so be it. If we're good in ourselves, then we've decreased the risk burden to everyone else. And hopefully we'll spread this information so that everybody can take part and gird themselves. Good question about the temperature. Yeah, but uh, as far question. as the inside the house is concerned, mm, that's a nebulous zone. <laughs> Something else that comes from our conversation last week, uh, Dr. Mensa, uh, towards the end of last week's broadcast, you talked about uh, a testing program that uh, was being developed with DHA labs. Um, I've got some questions asking for more details about that and also whether or not um, that program can be integrated with, say, a Mensa Medical uh, targeted nutrient therapy program. Okay. Well, the answer to the second question is yes. Um, first, first of all, most of our folks who are uh, at our, our patients, you know, we're already, each time we talk to you again, we're already kind of integrating a little bit of immune support there. First of all, your programs are doing a good job for that anyway. What we're talking about is what we call the immune health, uh, the immune support program that we've developed with Direct Health Access Labs. The reason for that is, you know, some people don't realize, and we've not generally tested, for example, vitamin C levels, okay? But this is a way to determine if your vitamin C levels are very low or if they're appropriate or if they could use some support, okay? Uh, zinc, we already know, if you're low in zinc, that's already a flag for immune dysfunction. Let's talk about pyrroles from another perspective, okay? Everyone knows about pyrroles with regard to uh, stress intolerance, anxiety, mood swings, rages, all those things. But uh, pyrroles also reflect inflammation. They reflect oxidative stress. Oxidative stress creates cellular damage. Cellular damage makes it difficult for all your cells, including your immune cells, to function properly. In fact, what it does is, once again, it creates a warning signal throughout your system that there is an inflammatory process that there's danger. Now our stress hormones go up, we're more so on fight or flight, and there's not enough time or resources for the body to commit to defending the immune system, defending your system by its way of improved cellular immunity. Not to mention if your zinc levels are low and you've got pyrroles and so forth, now your individual cells that fight infection, your white blood cells, your macrophages, those are the things that chomp, chomp, chomp on bacteria and viruses, by the way. Your macrophages can't function optimally. So by gaining insight into whether or not there's a, a pyrrole situation, a zinc situation, or now we look at a CBC, a complete blood cell count. Everybody's had one of those tests. I mean, if you're human and you're over 20, pretty much you've been to the doctor and had a CBC. Well, what if your white blood cell count is low? And we don't know that. That could be a source of potential challenge in terms of your immune function. And your primary doctor can work with you on that. You know, if your hemoglobin and hemocrat are, are low and you're anemic, that's another challenge that puts you in a risk category. So there are a variety of things that we can glean in terms of information from a CBC, and we're going to be evaluating that. So we'll be looking at things like zinc, your vitamin C, and a CBC as really just sort of a, a good surface indicator as to some things that we can do to try to help. We're trying to keep, you know, the cost of these programs low and accessible for everybody but we want to have enough information there to give us a really good start. And if you're already a patient, wonderful. These few extra pieces can take us in another direction. You know, if you're not, it's still a great way to tell if there's some support that you really need. And that program is available through um, DHA and a consultation with us as well. Okay, that's all part of the process. So 
That is the immune support program that we're working with. And again, it's something that you don't have to show up in a clinical office to do. Very good. Um, we've, I've got a question here that, that I find very interesting. I think I'd like to know the answer to this one as well. Um, and that is, we're hearing a lot in the news right now about potential treatments, uh, things that have been labeled as game changers for COVID-19, uh, zithromycin, um, the medicines that are used to uh, treat malaria, I believe it was. Um, and so the question that's been uh, expressed here is, um, should we be excited about these so-called game changers that are out there? And if we start developing symptoms, um, should we perhaps self-medicate and start using some of these? Don't you dare. Don't you dare. People have died trying this on their own. First of all, I'm not excited about either one of those medications because Zithromycin is an antibiotic, which means it deals with bacteria. We're dealing with a viral infection here. That's number one. Um, things like chloramphenicol, um, chloroquine, the malaria treatment medications, you know, those are, as, as my partner, Dr. Bowman would say, those are TBD, those are to be determined, okay? You know what really excites me? The, the, um, the concept of taking plasma from somebody who's got immunity and trying to use that to develop it. And, and hear me, this is going to be very odd for many of you to hear me say, but an actual vaccine based upon real proven efficacy, that's something that we can wait for. But to me, that's more exciting than these two drugs in combination. To me, that particular combined group is something that we have to wait and see with real proof that it works. Yeah. Because right now, I can't say that the mechanism that we are mostly uh, uh, understanding by the way these drugs two these two drugs work is actually going to work for a viral infection okay i'm i'm rather dubious about that but there are a whole lot of other very promising remedies that are out there that aren't even vaccine oriented that we can really take a look at right now and people are doing that so you know we're waiting for the word to come out that this is actually working before we get too excited but there are a lot of good things out there in the process that are not related to these two. Um, and, and you know, I'm not the only physician who holds this perspective, um, not by any means, okay? A lot of the, the absolute leaders in, in the infectious disease world are holding similar concepts, which is we'll have to wait and see on these two medications. But please, by all means, do not self-medicate. Do not try this on your own. There's a difference between being ill and being dead. Okay, if you're dead, you don't have to worry about the side effect profile of these medications. Um, just don't do it, please. And let's not forget also that when SARS first came out in China, that they were using IV vitamin C to stop the virus. And it was, uh, Dr. Menso, you and I talked about that, that that was um, very beneficial. So the things that Dr. Mensa has already shared with regard to specific nutrients and dosages are really, and uh, you know, also some of the, the dietary guidance that I've provided and just in general eating whole foods um, that are in abundance right now because people aren't thinking clearly, um, I, I think really are your best defenses uh, against this virus. Indeed. Um, Sam, you brought it up. I wasn't going to really talk too much about it, but if we, we look at the work of Dr. Linus Pauling, Nobel Prize wow. winner for work with vitamin C and cancer, that's a really powerful creature. And, and there are protocols out there that do some amazing things, but for a variety of reasons, they're not being talked about. Even the Chinese have used them during this very outbreak. And there's a lot of hush-hush around this. Since I don't really want to go there right now and get in trouble with the world of whomever, I'm not going to get into it too much right now, but I can tell you this, if there comes a time whereby there's an open ear to listen at a level of the nursing home or hospitals or whatever have you, we will be there to discuss it with them, and then we'll let you know about it, okay? But it's true, there's so much that can be done, which is why we're, we're prepping you a little bit here 
with giving you some of these dosages for things you can do to help protect yourself before you get into that kind of a situation, okay? Natural elements. Carl Pfeiffer said it best, for every drug that is out there, there's a, a natural agent that can do the same thing. And as we were created and put on this planet, we were put here not technically naked. There are natural elements to treat just about anything, anything, viruses, bacteria, it's here. We either just have to find it, or as Samantha just talked about, we have to acknowledge that it's there, let down our guard, remove the pride, get rid of our, our um, financial interests, and just use that which is appropriate, simple, and has real benefit. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Samantha, we've had a couple of questions that speak specifically to some of the things you've said today. Um, someone who's commenting on um, the bacteria, chemicals, toxins, and such that are in those bad foods, that are in those, uh, those highly processed foods, uh, and, and suggesting those are not just causing physical problems, but mental problems as well. Um, and so a couple of questions here related to that. Uh, can eating clean uh, or having our entire family eat clean as much as possible? Um, you know, what kind of overall benefit can we see uh, just in terms of physical health and mental health? And then another question that's kind of related, um, Samantha, you were speaking a little bit about um, being um, undermethylated and therefore um, folic acid not being a, a, a good thing for you. Um, and so just a question about, you know, explaining that a little bit more, uh, you know, what, what, when should folates be used? Uh, what are they and, and, and the like? Well, I'm going to let Dr. Mensa answer that question because I, I you know, he's, he king when it comes to, to methylation. And then I'm happy to speak to cleaning up the diet and all the amazing, wonderful things that that can do for your life and beyond. So Dr. Mensa, you, you take it away. Well, Sammy, I'm going to flip this on you because <laughs> I think that dealing with the dietary piece and helping people understand what, what eating clean can do for you, uh, and, and I'll just start you off, it can create a 360 degree turn in your life. Folks, if you haven't seen this one uh, movie on, on, on Netflix, this documentary called The Magic Pill, watch that. The Magic Pill, watch it. Sammy, please talk about, this is what you do. You turn lives around with diet. Tell them about it, in general. Well, I'll, you know, yeah, I mean, I'll just, before I knew, I'll just share briefly, before I knew that I was actually under methylated, I, I don't, some of you know this, I've shared this story before, but I was vegan for many years. And that is a tragedy for an undermethylated individual. And people wanna argue with me about this. It's not that I'm against veganism, I'm not. I say often if that, that diet and that lifestyle worked for me because I really did love it, I would still be vegan, but my body fell apart, my brain fell apart. Um, I also, uh, copper toxicity runs in my family and significant in my family because that's what copper does. So I was basically just eating these large bowls of copper and folate all day, juicing all these high folate vegetables, which we know depletes methyl at the level of DNA. And gee, I wonder, you know, no wonder I, I felt horrible. Um, and I was suicidal and my eating disorder was at an all time high, which is common in under methylators. Um, eating disorders are common for undermethylated individuals, not that they're not for overmethylators as well. There's addictive components for both, but um, I think that using my story to illustrate how folate, which is a wonderful nutrient, but it's not for everyone, and we've had to kind of debate this a little with people because some people think that there's no such thing and tell people there's no such thing as over and under methylation, which you know, we have 50 years of research and clinical application that clearly shows otherwise. Um, but 
we want to make sure because we, uh, you know, this is an epigenetic phenomenon, we don't make enough methyl groups to support enzymes. We've talked about enzymes, hormones, and neurotransmitters. So as undermethylators, what are we low in? Serotonin, dopamine, another one called norepinephrine. What does dopamine do? It's that pleasure. What does serotonin do? Regu helps regulate sleep, appetite. All of these neurotransmitters and hormones regulate sleep, appetite, mood, thought, our behavior, everything. So when we have a substance, and again, I'm not saying folate is bad. We're not saying that folate is bad, um, but it's not good for us. When we have something that strips methyl that we already are not making enough of, it can lead to a lot of dire uh, challenges. So my job as a, a nutritional therapy practitioner is to help you figure out, once you're properly tested, what types of foods are going to be appropriate for you and um, you know, staying away from the ones that are really high in folate, like spinach is a good example of something that is high in folate. Broccoli is another example. But there are a lot of vegetables that are not, and that can create quite a variety for, 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 for us as, as undermethylated individuals. So um, with that being said, I will just say that once I figured that out and I started eating appropriately for my chemistry, um, my world changed, and I, you know, I'll never forget the day I walked through the Mensa Medical Clinic doors. Um, miraculously, I got an appointment right away. I was living in California, which I, I still am, and I, I was very suicidal. I remember sitting with Dr. Bowman and Dr. Mensa. I was crying the whole time. They explained everything to me in great detail. I started my program, and it changed my life. Um, cleaning up my diet and incorporating more methyl, which comes from animal products uh, and proteins, um, making sure I didn't have a high folate diet, which is what I was doing previously. Uh, getting those good fats. Dr. Mensa talked about um, fatty acids earlier with the liver conversation. So ensuring that I was eating fats that were also appropriate and supportive of my brain. So I tell you this long story because I hope this illustrates what folates can do um, for someone like myself and how when we approach diet based on individual chemistry, mm -hmm. how that can just open things up in a way that you know we never think possible. Sleep, we've already talked about sleep energy. I had no energy. Uh, again, I was depressed and suicidal. And of course I had a lot of OCD around food because I had an eating disorder. So it took time, um, but those things went away, and I, I wouldn't be where I am today had I not gone through that process. So I hope that helps. Forgive the long story. I hope that's beneficial to you. Sammy, if somebody doesn't know their chemistry, so in, in one way, let's not, let's not forget that folates are important to a certain level, but we don't want to go to the extreme with folates if you don't know your chemistry or if you're undermethylated because we all do need folates to some degree or another. But Sammy, somebody doesn't know their chemistry and they're sitting there, you know, what do you tell someone who sits back and says, hey, you know, um, I really like my burgers and my fries, okay? And fine, I'm Dr. Mensa, I'm a pizza holic, okay? Back in those days and every now and then, you know, what do you tell them about, hey, how do you eat cleanly? How do you eat cleanly? What does that really mean? Um, a lot of buzzwords and stuff going on around diet. What, what does it really mean to eat healthy and, and balanced, balanced, if you will? What does any of that really mean to, to folks? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And the, the first thing that came to my mind when you shared that about the burgers and the fries and the pizza is that everything that you love, I can give you a substitute that's going to be healthy for you and satisfy that craving. You can make your burgers, you can have your pizza, but there's other ways to make a crust, for example, without grains. There's things that we can do to create a bun for your burger that don't include gluten that has a powerful impact on the brain and the gut in some pretty detrimental ways. Um, so I like to approach diet and what it means to eat clean is basically you know, what, what's coming out of nature, you know, because if it doesn't have the ability to rot, then, you know, 
maybe you might want to think twice about eating it. If it comes in a box with, you know, Know, you know, we're familiar with that buzzword, in addition to eating for your chemistry, is really just about eating things that come from nature that are going to break down quickly if you don't eat them, <laughs> um, and are, uh, you know, things that are um, going to give us those, their macronutrients, proteins, carbs, and fats, um, in the form of fresh fruits and vegetables, proteins, etc., but they're going to contain a cocktail of micronutrients that are going to feed our cells, that are going to, you know, again, for someone like myself, they're going to bring methyl into the system with the assistance of amino acids and support our system on that cellular level. So that's my very best analogy of what it means to eat clean. We want to have a rainbow of beautiful fresh fruits and vegetables. We want to make sure that we're eating things in their whole and natural state as much as possible so that we can retain all those nutrients. Thank you, uh, Sammy. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And um, one other question that just popped up, and, and we've got just a couple more questions that we can get to here today. Uh, but one question that just popped up, uh, and, and Dr. Mensa, I've heard you um, speak to this in the past. Um, we've got some folks out there that don't quite know what we're talking about when we're saying overmethylated and undermethylated. Um, and uh, it, Samantha, you've kind of spoken to that in 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 sharing your story. But Dr. Mensa, if you want, if you could, uh, you know, maybe give a little bit more clarity on that. Okay. The way I like to put it is that. Um, systems in your body like any system in your house okay so picture this beautiful home that you live in or your mansion or you know your one bedroom apartment whatever the deal is um there is always a, a, a switch that controls some operation in your home so i like to talk about light switches okay you turn the light um switch on when you walk into your your home and the lights come on okay you turn the switch down and the lights go off and that's based upon your need. If you need light, you turn up the switch, it goes on. Now, the way I reference this is that methyl molecules are literally carbon atoms with three or four hydrogens. That's the, the molecular structure, a carbon atom with three or four hydrogens. Those molecules are like Legos. They attach themselves to an enzyme, like what Sammy was talking about earlier, or a hormone, or a neurotransmitter, or even your DNA. There isn't an enzyme, a hormone, or, or a molecular structure agent that doesn't get attached to a methyl molecule or some other molecule for regulation purposes. Now, when that bonding happens, stuff happens, okay? We get processes moving. We get things being turned on and things being turned off. Now, let's assume you've got, oh, a few trillion reactions that have to happen in a fraction of a second, okay? Well, in theory, you should have probably about a trillion methyl molecules attached to those systems to turn them on or turn them off. What happens if you only got like a few hundred thousand? You're severely, severely low. It means that parts of that beautiful home of yours are not going to be happening, they're not going to be working very well. So your light switches aren't going to be able to regulate light very well all the time. You know what? The switch that goes to your refrigerator may not be on much at all. So you try cooking and living in a home where the lights don't work half the time. The refrigerator, you don't know when you're gonna have uh, ice and agents to cool your food so your food spoils. Your heat isn't gonna work all the time. You'd be miserable, right? Now that's just if the electrical wiring and stuff, the switches don't work in your home, okay? I gotta tell you, only about a month ago, I walked into my basement because uh, I came home and I found out the lights were, were, were dark. And I went to the basement, and I'm like, I don't know which switch to turn on here. So I started working with them. And after about an hour, I realized there was one key switch that was not in the right place, just one, and half my home is dark, okay? If you don't have enough of these switches, it's what we call being under-methylated, okay? So in other words, your systems don't get the proper regulation control and things are not working properly. 
in the, the mental health world, that can lead to things like anxiety, depression, OCD, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, ADHD, and autism. Even Alzheimer's is a certain component. But what about the opposite, okay? What if you've got way too many switches operating all the time? One of the big creatures there is you get too much activation of neurotransmitters and hormones and a variety of things, and people may have a racing mind. They may have bipolar disorder. They may have severe depression. They may have suicidal ideation. And for those naysayers out there, let me tell you, doctors, I'm talking to you right now, overmethylation is one of the key reasons why individuals who are taking SSRIs or atypical antipsychotics commit suicide, especially young people. That low histamine gets lowered by these medications. And let me tell you something, I don't care if you believe me or not, people will die because of this, so I'm talking to you, okay? But if you don't recognize that it exists, you can't test for it. If you can't test for it, you can't determine which medications may be harmful to you. Now look, I've seen kids die, I've seen adults die. We've seen professionals die because of medication changes that pushed people in the wrong direction. So this is serious, this is not a joke about who's right or who's wrong, this is about the facts. Okay, I've seen it and I don't wanna see it anymore, so I'm telling all you people out there, Overmethylation is a big issue when it comes to the use of pharmaceutical medications. So let's get back to normal. We'll defibrillate, calm things down, okay? Way too many methyl molecules can be just as, prob as problematic as far too few methyl molecules. Methyl is like a switch, okay? It is a regulator. It turns things on, it turns things off. Those things are enzymes, hormones, or neurotransmitters. And yes, it can be just that simple conceptually. Of course, these mechanisms are far more complicated than what, I'm trying to, than what I'm sharing with you. But if you have this basic understanding, and let me tell you, when I train doctors all over the world, this is the same explanation I give them. And of course, later on, we have to sit down and go to molecular cell biology and discuss it with them at that level, okay? But basically, just think about the light switch. If you don't have enough, you tend to live in darkness. If you have way too many, you've got strobe lights going on all over the place your brain can't settle, your systems don't work properly, and you can ultimately become very, very depressed, okay? So that's the deal pretty much with methylation. See, now you know more than 99% of the doctors out there. <laughs> very good, very Methylation good. 101. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm gonna, we, we are just about at the 90 minute mark this time, so I'm gonna just ask one more question, and I'm gonna ask it because I know, Dr. Mensa, you have a, a, a personal interest as it relates to um, cancer um, and, and using nutrient therapy uh, as it relates to, to cancer. And I'm just going to read this particular question um, in, for the most part in its entirety. I realize you may not be able to answer this question. I'm going to ask it anyway. If someone is on immunotherapy for cancer, would you recommend the same basic dosages that you mentioned before for vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc? And this person goes on to say, please don't just tell me to speak to my oncologist um, <laughs> because the oncologist doesn't really know much about nutrition and supplementation. <laughs> okay. Um, cancer is a very serious topic. And, and those of you um, who know, somewhat about my history um, and why this is so important. Uh, I lost two very good friends in med school to breast cancer. One of them came, uh, literally followed me from one university to the other. We weren't dating, okay? Um, she was a, an undergraduate relative to my status in med school. And I didn't like that school. I, I left and went to another one. But uh, this young lady, very sweet young lady, uh, got married, uh, didn't make it past her pediatric residency, second year, and she died of breast cancer. Another very good friend of mine, um, she's doing well. She's a breast cancer, not only survivor, but a thriver. I found out, you know, years after graduation, she had had breast cancer. She was doing really well. Uh, we met, we saw each other at a party. And then less than a year later, she was gone. Now, I wasn't in this field at that time, but I said, you know, if I ever determine or find anything that can help with cancer, especially breast cancer, I'm going to fight it with all my might because 
really good people are not here because of that creature. So knowing what we know now, there are many great elements and approaches to actually help support cancer. We actually have a cancer support protocol at Medicine Medical, um, and we've taught doctors globally how to use this. It's very complicated for, for novices. We don't, you know, you've got to go through X number of training with us, uh, you know, at, a, at that level, you know, abroad before we even broach the topic. But it is certainly possible to support cancer, especially solid tumors, with some very key elements. Now, the problem is that it's not an easy question to answer. First of all, you've got to talk about the type of cancer that's present. Immunotherapy, by the way, is great therapy. It is. In this realm, we're not talking about substituting nutrients for, uh, real, for treatment that is traditional medicine. You've got to bring every piece of arsenal you've got to the game to fight cancer. I mean, everything. Your oncologist says do this, you do it. Okay, they're experts in that. We can certainly talk about additional pieces to help. I know that's the question you're asking, okay? But see, timing is also key. If you're going through a round of radiation or a round of chemo, we can't tell you to take vitamin C, okay? You'll end up with a potential for, for bleeding issues and a variety of other things going on that can actually make you sicker overall. Um, so, what really happens is that we have to have real communication with your oncologist. We have to know when you're at the timing of your next therapy is going to be. Some therapies, when, when any of our patients at Medicine Medical have come down with cancer for a variety of reasons, um, or started with cancer for that matter, we tell them, look, before you do chemo, we've got to have two weeks knowledge ahead of time. So we stop your nutrients, literally stop your nutrients a few weeks before your chemo, and you can restart them a few weeks after chemo is done. Okay, it's not a very simple question and it's not a very simple process. There is a great way to combine the two, but if you're really interested in that, I would suggest you contact me privately, okay? You can um, contact us at our um, clinic, um, www.mensamedical.com. Uh, Mr. Wells will give you our telephone number, you know, and then we can ask some very important questions about the type of cancer you have, the kind of therapy you're undergoing. Um, it is not antagonistic to traditional cancer therapies. That's the most important thing I can tell you. And it is not a substitute. It is an adjunct to help you do the best you can while you move through that process. Again, many people who have cancer, remember cancer feeds off of you like a parasite. It steals your vital force, it steals your energy, it steals your protein machinery from literally your cell structure, and turns it into something that produces fuel for it. So cancer grows by feeding off of you and telling your system to make stuff that helps it grow. That's where we try to intervene, along with your other therapies. So it is possible, it works together, nutrients are good, but there's a specific timing and there's a specific capacity with your particular nutrients based upon your cancer. So I know that didn't give you the simple answer you were looking for, um, I'm not going to say, okay, yeah, I'll go talk to your oncologist, but how about give us more information so that we can help try to understand where you are and maybe we can help discuss with your oncologist what kind of treatment you're engaging in. And then we can make suggestions that are appropriate that will not conflict with anything else. Okay. Very complicated issue, but doable. Thank you, Dr. Mensa. And, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Um, we're at 90 minutes, which is where we said we were going to try and wrap things up. Uh, very quickly, very quickly, Dr. Mensa and, and Samantha, tell us a little bit about what you've got planned for next week. Sammy? Yes, um, I'm, I'm excited for next week. We're going to be going into the pediatric arena. And Dr. Mensa and I, we're going to do our very best in the 30 minutes that we have. We may run over, but we really want to be supporting your kids. We're going to be talking about autism, behavioral disorders, um, you know, you name it. We really want to focus on that. We want to support you. So if you think of any questions ahead of time, please let us know. You can always get in touch with me through social media uh, and my website, but, you know, I mean, Dr. Mensa, please, uh, you know, whatever you'd like to add, but, um, you know, we, we really want to be able to support 
uh, parents and their and their children in this next uh, session. Sammy, I think you've said it all. You said it quite well. Um, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're looking at not just general approaches to immune support, but different categories of individuals. Um, so the next up would be the kids. Okay, they're the tough ones. You know, many of you parents out there, you cave and you don't need to do that. You need to develop a little bit of a, of a harder stance towards your kids with regard to diet and those choices. And believe me, I've been there. I'm a parent. I know about kids say, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. Well, you know what? Forgive me. Starve. Okay. <laughs> Four or five days, I promise you eating whatever you've got out there. And you're going to say, oh, that Dr. Mensa, he's easy. I don't know where he's getting that stuff from. Doesn't sound like much of a parent to me. <laughs> Watch the magic pill. I'm telling you, you're going to learn something. Great from that. film. Yeah, very great good. film. Very good. Well, again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if you do have questions that you want to get in the queue before our next session, feel free to email them directly to me at djwells at mensamedical.com. Um, otherwise, join us next week. And as you've done with this session, just Plug your questions in and, and we'll get them answered as best we can. Thanks again for joining us. We're going to post this to our Facebook page and to YouTube a little bit later this evening. So if there's uh, material that you want to review, things that you want to hear back, or if you want to share with your friends uh, and family members that, uh, that this video is available for them to take a look at. Uh, it will be out there and available for you later on this evening. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Sammy. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Thank you. Thank you both.